Okay, everyone. Thank you for coming to our session. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping rules that Affiliate Summit want me to uh, make known to you. First of all, uh, you, when, you got, when you came here, you should have received a little attendee, uh, I guess, a feedback sheet. Uh, we, this is how we determine whether or not uh, these events, your feedback is very important to us. So if you can, do fill it out. And a couple of reasons you want to fill it out. The first reason is that every day, there'll be five entries will be randomly chosen from those sheets, and those winners will receive a free Networking Plus Pass to Affiliate Summit West 2018 in Las Vegas. All right, so, uh, so everyone got the form. You see the form in front of you? So just fill out your name, uh, your email address, and then just check off the number 10, and it'll be perfect. All right, yeah, all right. now, uh, what we're gonna, how is this session going to go? is this is an interactive session. I will be asking questions from our panelists for the first half of the session. And then afterward, uh, you will have the opportunity to ask questions from the panel as well. So we will have a mic that will come to where you are. You have a question, when we, when we call for it, just raise your hand. The mic will come to you, ask a question into the mic so we can record it, and then we'll answer your question. All right? So let's begin by introducing the panel, well, starting to my immediate left with Syed. Hi, uh, I'm Syed Balki. I'm the founder of WP Beginner. It's the largest WordPress resource site. Among that, I have also created several software. Um, the most popular one is Optin Monster, which helps you get more email subscribers. Hey, everybody. My name is John Rampton. I have a company called Do, do.com. We're a payments company. We help people get merchant accounts online. I'm Zach Johnson, and I blog at zachjohnson.com and blogging.org, and I basically create resources and online tutorials to help other people create websites and blogs and make money online. And I'm John Chow, your moderator. I'm the blogger at johnchow.com. I'm also the author of Blogging Secrets and Make Money Online, and let's, let's just go right to the begin. All right, so this is the seven-figure blogging session, so we'll begin with the most obvious question, and... Uh, what is the best way to make money from a blog? By the way, I want to say something right before we begin. Um, we want to answer questions that you guys have as well. So if you guys have a question at any time, you guys can raise your hand and they'll bring a microphone around. I'll, I'll say that anytime you guys have a question, I don't want you guys to have to wait till the very, very yeah. end. If you guys have a pressing question that's in the moment. So raise your hand. A person will come around to you, the microphone. And as soon as we've stopped talking, you can, we'll call on you and you can answer your question. All right? Good. Yeah, are we alive? Yeah. You guys alive? I want to hear screaming. All right. <laughs> well, we just want to make the other speakers just to get jealous. An idea really. Also. That's really what it is. Uh, it's just an gonna, thing. How many people here came from outside the United States? Wow, wow. That's nice. A lot. So oh who who traveled the furthest? Like how many hours? Who's the longest hours here? How many hours? <laughs> seventeen hours. Anyone anyone longer than seventeen hours? How many hours? 20 in Australia. 20 yeah. hours from Australia. Thank right. you very much. Well, welcome. Welcome. Okay. And uh, you're still awake. I mean, that's... <laughs> okay. Barely. All right. So let's get uh, back to it. Uh, this is about making money from blogging. So uh, we'll be given the like, most obvious question is, what do, you, what do you feel are the best way to make money from blog? And how are you guys currently monetizing your blogs? Um, so I think the best way to make money from your blog evolves as your audience grows. You know, like most people, I when I started blogging, I was making money from just placing advertisement on my blog. Uh, and then after, you know, after that, I realized that some advertisers were performing better and I started becoming their affiliate and affiliate marketing became, became like a pretty large source of income for me. And then from there onward, as my audience grew and I, as I hired more people in my team, we started creating our own products. And for me now, products is, our, is the biggest source of um, revenue. So we run WPBeginner.com. That's the website I started, and we teach people how to use WordPress, how to start their website. So it was natural for us to give them the tools to help start their website. So I created you know, several WordPress plugins, like a contact form plugin, a gallery plugin, et cetera. And we, you know, I partnered with other, other developers and started selling those products on our blog, and that's the biggest source of income for us now. You know, when I started blogging, uh, I just blogged on my own site. Uh, I had a site called Techie Mania, 
I, uh, I blogged three times a day for around eight months, and I made this much money. Zero. Um, I then, I, I decided, and that's a lot of work. Three, three posts a day, I mean, it took me several hours every single day. I did this for several months. Uh, then I actually, I met this guy. I went to his site, ZachJohnson.com. Highly recommend it. And I read his guide on how to blog, and he said, hey, maybe you should put some ads on your site. And I was like, well, I do have ads on my site. One tricky little technique he said is go look around all the people out there, see who's advertising on, on their site, and put one or two of those people on your site, and then leave one spot open. So I did that, and then all of a sudden the next month, some one like one random advertiser started advertising. And I opened up another spot, and another spot, and another spot, until around a year later I was making a very healthy income. I was actually making more blogging than I was at my full-time job um, and it totally was possible I mean this wasn't that long I mean it was literally month one I made like 200 month two it was like 600 month three and I started actually making money learning from people who had actually done this so again we're gonna talk about a little bit about this today um, later down the road I'm now probably eight years down the road from when I started actually blogging now I have my own products my own services and this is where I make money and I blog so that I can attract people to my actual products, and that's how I make money today. Yeah, so I think the common misconception with blogging is to simply blog, but that's not the case because there's over a billion active websites on the internet today, and they're all creating content. So for you to be able to compete with these guys, you actually need to niche down as much as possible and become the authority within your space. So what you want to do is find a solution that you can give to people that are searching for something every day. So you can take something as generic as how to improve your credit score or something that people are going to search every day into Google and simply be the best at that. And don't just have content, you actually have to give them a solution and a call to action on your website. So my website, blogging.org, for example, people end up on that website because they want to learn how to start a blog. And I say, do this step by step by step. And that monetization play is in place and it makes me money. But at the same time, it's showing the people that come to my website how to take action and you're gaining the trust of the audience and they're also pretty much becoming a fan of what you have to say. And that's something that builds up over time. And I can actually build products and services that I've done over the years as well. So you want to niche down as much as possible, provide that service, and really niche down so that you can become the authority in that space and don't go too generic. Otherwise, you'll never be able to compete. Uh, I will add that you should not be too quick to try to monetize your blog, especially if you're using this advertising as your main source of income. The, uh, in the beginning, when you start a blog, you're trying to build a readership. You're trying to get people to come to your blog. But putting a banner ad or any type of advertising on your blog creates kind of like a paradox or counterintuitive. You know, you're spending all this time trying to write great content, people get to people to your site, but then you got this big flashy banner saying, click me, click me, click me. And what they, what's that doing? That's taking people away from your site. So it's kind of like, so first eight months of my blog's life, it made nothing. I have no advertising on no whatsoever because I was just trying to build an audience. And once you build the audience, then you can look at monetizing that audience. Like if you look at any big Fortune 500 company like Facebook, when Facebook first started, did you try to monetize the site from the get-go? No, they, they don't. They, they built the audience first and then they monetize the audience. And so, uh, I mean, it's great to make money from it, but uh, it's sometimes up, but it's also better to, to build the audience first and then you can really make the payoff down the road. All right, so... Uh, well, well, blogging is great and everything, but it's not all great bed of roses. So, you know, it's like some of the stuff, uh, there are some negatives to it. So I want to talk to you guys, since you guys have been doing it for quite a long time. What's some of the stuff you hate about blogging? Uh, I'd say one of the most annoying things about blogging is getting emails every single day asking for guest posts on my website or <laughs> to place a link on my site for like $20 and just crazy emails that we I know John gets a ton of emails from random people around the world asking for money and whatnot. So the crazy emails that you get, that could be annoying. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I get hundreds of emails every single day. Um, it gets very, very annoying. I write for big sites. I mean, I primarily don't blog on my own site. I blog for like Mashable, TechCrunch, um, Inc., Forbes, Huffington Post, uh, on all those different sites. So I get a million people every single day saying, hey, write about my company, write about my company. Um, and usually it's just right about my company. It's not actually a well-crafted pitch that actually would get through the barrier. 
Yeah, I guess uh, in today's today's day, the most annoying thing is is the number of email volume um, that I get. The irrelevant, you know, spam emails, promote this, promote that. But in the earlier days, one of the things that I didn't like about blogging was coming up with blog post ideas. Um, you know, when you, when you're starting out, you have, you know, you, you might have few good ideas, and after if you've been doing it consistently, maybe once a day for six months, eight months, nine months. After a while, you will run out of ideas, uh, and I really hated that, and it you know, kind of left a gap in my consistency. So I decided, why not just ask my audience for questions? So I started doing a reader census every year, and as my audience have grown, now like my content calendar, in terms of ideas wise, is planned all the way till June 2018. So I know exactly what content is going out on the blog tomorrow and then Thursday. I don't have to think about ideas. And now we just like do a brainstorming session, uh, and do a sense, reader census and come up with all the ideas. Yeah, when, um, when I'm just talking to people, I come up with an idea and I just, the content idea. <laughs> I keep it on a little pad here. But I do notice that uh, a common theme in between, at least between uh, John and Zach, is that the email, the amount of volume email to get people just asking free stuff, backlinks, or whatever. Obviously, that is the wrong approach. So uh, as a follow-up to that question, Actually, how, the, how... One, right before that, we had an audience question. Do you just want to say your question, and then I'll repeat it for the audience, just so we can snag it right now? Yeah, so the question was is, um, you know, you've set up your blog, you've done all that. How important is testing out your blog, testing how things work, and testing how important is that to the growth of your blog? I personally don't test a ton of things because I know once I put content out there, I already have an audience and readership that's going to come. But I can look at the engagement of uh, basically if I'm creating a tutorial, I know that's going to work best with my audience because they can follow through step by step. But in terms of split testing different ways to actually measure those call to actions, uh, you can use some great tools out there. I know Syed is probably one of the best ones up here for talking about optimization and split testing. So I'll let him get into that a little. Yeah, so we split test on the design itself, right? You can use a tool like Visual Website Optimizer um, or even Google Optimize now that, that lets you, you know, test different sections of your website. But if you're in the early stage of your blog, you know, focus on creating the content and that targets your user avatar. Whatever issue, you know, you're trying to solve, give them that solution. Your number one focus should be there. Once you start getting traffic, like, you know, testing with five users, you're, you don't have significant enough data to make, come to any calculations. You might as well just be closing your eyes and throwing in, in the dark. Um, but, you know, focus on creating good content that's answering the questions to your avatar and then worry about testing once you have you know, several thousand people coming to your website. Okay. Now, like I said, the common theme between Zach and, and John was that they get a lot of uh, requests, spam requests, or what kind of requests, asking for backlinks, or asking for questions, lending money, or can you write about me, that kind of stuff. And obviously that is the incorrect approach to approach a, uh, a millionaire blogger. So uh, my question, I guess as a follow-up, is like, if the members of the audience you know, wish to email you guys, how can they word their question or what the request in a way that you would respond? Uh, an easy way is to simply start retweeting our content or sharing it with other audiences, providing input, leaving blog comments on your website. Make it at least show that you've uh, put some time and effort because it's really easy when we get these emails to say if, if they're automated or if they're just being sent out to a lot of people. Sometimes they'll have an unsubscribe link at the bottom, which means they're just being sent out at mass. Sometimes they won't even be addressed, and a lot of times they're easily put together like a template. It'll say, I visited your website, so-and-so link was really interested, here's a valuable resource that I think you would like. So it's really <laughs> obvious when we get these, and more often than not, we're just going to delete them. So yeah. you want to actually get our interest, find out what we're interested in. Maybe if we like a favorite sports team, you can say, hey, I just followed this team, and I just uh, wanted to get your thoughts on it. 
or seeing what they're doing on social media. Get personal with these people because that's going to work a thousand times better than if you just send out a thousand emails and only get one or two responses. So actually put some time and effort and hey, if you send someone a gift or something, they're going to notice that. So it works a lot gifts. better than uh, an email with that's just a base template. Uh, I would say to stand out, know a little bit about the person that you're writing to. Uh, I have pitches all the time and the ones that stand out to me, they know me, they know my style of writing, they know what I actually write about. You know, uh, I have people all the time pitch me health products. I don't write about health products. So why are you pitching me? Like, know what the person that you're pitching. Uh, I also have kind of a two to three sentence limit. So uh, if you write more than three sentences, I'm probably just going to delete it because it's not worth my time um, to write it. Keep in mind, a lot of people, like I write about lots of things, um, so I might be an outlier, but um, know what the person writes about and then pitch them on the right subjects that do that. Gifts are awesome and stuff like that, but make sure it's the right gifts. I have people send me stuff all the time that are just completely useless to me. I like I don't drink, and I have probably one bottle of wine show up at my house at least once a month. Like I don't drink. Like Know that about the person. Know, know things about them. I'd also say, um, as well, know what time to contact. The best time to contact a person is typically between 5.30 and 6.30 a.m. If it comes at 1 a.m., it's going to be at the end of my inbox. If it comes right at that time, it's typically when most people that are writing and blogging are starting to get up and we're sitting in our beds or just starting to work. That's the best time to contact at least me, but I'd say most people in general. Uh, I'm fairly generous with my with my community and engaging with them. Uh, so the best way to, I guess, be more approachable and, and get a response is to be kind in your email, show that you're a self-starter, show that you are you have done the research. You know, if you, if you send an email saying, hey, I'm looking for, you know, tips on how to make more money online, you know, you should, instead of emailing me, go to google.com, right? Because it doesn't show me anything that you have taken initiative. But if you, if you have read maybe one of my articles, hey, Syed, I read your article on, you know, 19 tips to get more traffic. And I saw, you know, I really wanted to learn more about the remarketing aspect of it. And I had this specific question that showed me that, you know, you have taken the initiative, you took the advice that I, I put in my blog post and have taken action and you might be stuck in a little area and I would be more than happy to respond to you. Um, just be mindful that, you know, everybody you're emailing have, you know, their own schedule, they're relatively busy, so respect their time, keep your emails concise, uh, you know, and don't like make the mistake, I guess, to just say pitch, pitch, pitch. Like, you know, hey, I just started blogging. I would love to get featured on your site. That's not necessarily the best way to start a conversation. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And so basically just make a, an effort to get to know the blogger that you are targeting to try to get something from. A uh, great example, I guess, uh, many, uh, was a mark, a network, an, an affiliate network wanted to uh, me to pitch, you know, talk about their products. So basically, instead of targeting me, they actually targeted my daughter. So they, so they actually made an effort to find out that I had a daughter and uh, she saw a video. So they sent her a bunch of gifts. They sent her a little T-shirt that says Future Blogger, and they sent her a whole bunch of stuff. And I thought that was great. I made a video about it, put it on YouTube, and they, they got coverage. Yep. And so, you know, like, so if you just make an effort, you'll get a response. If you're just going to, like the form emails I get all the time, that's from the 4% club. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh so yeah you talk a bit about you know different ways you come up with different post ideas but let's expand it a little bit like uh, uh how are you guys coming up with your post idea for me like most of my post idea comes actually comes from my readers feedback from my readers. that's that's my biggest source of post idea but how about you how about you guys you want to start ahead? uh so i guess i have several different sources of um uh, where ideas where we're getting ideas from uh, number one, uh, for WP Beginner, we have a lot of technical content, and our, a lot of our users are still on Twitter. So we just use search.twitter.com, and I look up the hashtag WordPress and see what kind of questions people are asking for. Um, I also use this really cool tool. It's called Answer the Public. Um, just answerthepublic.co.uk, maybe, or answerthepublic.com. Um, but just type it in Google, Answer the Public. And then you enter whatever keyword you're writing about and it will show you all the different questions users are asking about that particular space. So let's say if I was writing about photography and I type photography, it will say, uh, it might have a question like, you know, what is the best way to take certain angle photo, right? So I'm getting all these really good questions that are long tail search wise and that's how 
you know, that's, that's one source of content ideas that I'm getting. We obviously do our, um, you know, user census, the reader census thing that we do. Um, and we get tons and tons and tons of content ideas from that. Uh, I am also actively looking on Quora, uh, where, you know, people are asking different questions about WordPress and I keep an active eye on that. And, uh, the folks at BuzzSumo, which is another really neat tool, BuzzSumo has a questions tool now. So you can type in your keyword and it will, it will go look at all the different questions database, uh, including Quora and Stack Exchange, Yahoo Answers, and like a whole bunch of them. And then you can, f you can see what kind of questions people are asking. Because again, at, at our blog at WP Beginner, my goal is to help people find the answers to their questions on WordPress. So if one person is having this question, they're not the only person who's having that question. So, so in my process, it's a pretty you know, elaborate process. And we, when we're doing the brainstorming, we just sit down and look at all these things to come up with a content calendar. Um, so yeah, so on Monday, like for example, we do like a quick tip. On Tuesday, we do a pillar article. On Wednesday, we go back and rewrite an article that maybe we had written in 2009 that are still getting traffic but needs a significant overhaul. On Thursday, we write another like long how-to. On Friday, we do showcases. So, and then I, I, we, my team and my goal is to make sure we are filling these these areas so we can cater every single bit of our audience. Yes, so, yeah, all right. So I could take this one from kind of two different sides. I have ZachJohnson.com, and I've been in the industry for about 20 years now. So I have a lot of personal experiences that I can write about. And while you might not think that something that you know is of great knowledge to somebody else just because it comes second nature to you. It actually could provide a lot of value. So I could potentially write a post about the power of networking and why it's so important to take advantage of a, a conference like this because you never know who you're going to know and who they might know and what that could lead to. And then on the flip side, I have blogging.org where, like Syed, we create content for people that want to start a blog and whatever. And while the concept of how to install WordPress or install the best WordPress plugins has been talked about a million different times instead of worrying that you're just going to fall into the mix you have to figure out how to make it better than the competition provide better resources and then get it in front of that audience so just because something's been talked about already a million times don't completely discard that spend more time on creating that amazing content and then even more time promoting it so i think a lot of people look at blogging and think that they need to actually just create content nonstop, and that's not the issue because a website or a blog that has Five to ten posts could be a thousand times more successful than a site that has a new blog post going live every day, but doesn't have the actual promotion going behind it. So for me, uh, I also use Buzz BuzzSumo. Uh, BuzzSumo is a really great product. Uh, it does cost it costs about a hundred bucks a month. Totally worth it for me. Um, I use it a little bit differently than than Syed. Uh, it has a section where you can type in. Now there are several tools that you can do uh, has a section where you can type in most popular I type in motivation and I it shows me over the past six months 12 months year five years what's the most popular piece of content that talks about motivation I then go take that title and I rework it to whatever I'm writing about because theoretically keep in mind when you're writing a title is the most important thing that you should be doing I spend about 50% of all the time I put into writing a blog post and putting up a blog post into writing a title. Because that if nobody clicks on a title, they're never going to read it. So a title is very, very important. So I go again into BuzzSumo, I type in whatever theme I'm talking about. I usually type in something that's very, very popular and I rewrite the title to what I'm trying to get out there. So for us, we're talking about payments and a very popular title is, 10 motivational tips to do this. So I write, hey, here's how, and I relate it to payments and somehow, and then I put like backed by science or you know, different things that you see in very popular titles. You'll start noticing them come up over and over and very inspirational things. And I apply that to what I'm doing. Um, next thing I do is I meet together once a month. We meet on the first Wednesday. We have a group call with like anywhere from five to 10 different of my friends. And we each write 10 different titles for the other person to write about. So if there's five people on the thing, I write 50 different titles. And that gives them ideas and it helps them out. And at the same time, they're helping me out. It's very good to go in a different thing. Lots of times we get siloed in this. It has to be this. It has to be B, 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 B. And versus somebody else has a whole new perspective. 
the more you can work together with other people to help you with titles, the more like the wider your audience will become because you're not closed off to certain things. Yeah, I just want to p- piggyback on that. When you're just starting out, that's very important to have your own cohort. A lot of times when you're starting out, you want to, you know, talk with the top super superstar bloggers. You're way better off, you know, having your own cohort. Like for example, when John started, he was on a rock star blogger and Chu, and you know, they they were just friends, and you know, they kind of grew grow their stuff together. Uh, and then for titles, very very important. Uh, there's a there's a tool called EMV Headline Analyzer. This emotional Great value, one. right? EMV Headline Analyzer. So you can type your title there, and it will it will give you a score. Um, and there's also another one. Uh, by co-schedule so if you just type in google headline analyzer by co-schedule um, you'll find you'll find a pretty good tool you can insert your um, title there and it will give you a score trick is just to use power words and i think co-schedule have like a cheat sheet bus sumo has like you know tons of case studies where they've analyzed you know hundreds of thousands of headlines that have gone viral and what aspect what keywords they contain so definitely look look at those data driven um, case studies because they will help you create better titles. All right, awesome. Now, uh, on the subject of collaboration, I know that uh, when I first started, I did all the blog posts myself, and you know, then the lot. Uh, how many of you? How many people here actually write all their own blog, co- all their own content? And not that many, but how many people actually sub out some of the content, like to other other writers and stuff? And well, exactly, right. So I want to. <laughs> Uh, so basically, how do you go about hiring blogger who approach you? Like, from, like, how do you filter them out? So I hire a lot of writing for our company. Um, we have a lot. Um, it, basically, it comes down to relationships. Typically, I'll give pretty much anybody a chance on writing a blog post if they are a good speaker and they have a little bit of credit behind them. And then over time, I work in some of the best authors. And again, it's more a relationship game. Um, And over time, you find the best writers and they start standing out. You start noticing uh, different writers. Their content will do 10 times better than anybody else. Um, But I'll give most people a chance uh, as long as their email, one, doesn't have a ton of grammatical errors. You get that all the time. I want to write for you and it's horrible. But um, and then it's just weeding through. It's it's work. Uh, for me, at least, uh, we have a pretty systematic process in in hiring. Number one, one of the mistakes that you most likely did not will make if you don't do this properly is if you need to create your own voice and a voice like you know guideline. So we have what we call a character diamond. Um, anything our authors write have to match our brand's character diamond. Uh, so that's kind of like you know voice guidelines. This is what we do. This is why we do what we do, and kind of explain everything, and then. After that, in terms of like, you know, finding the right people, go to um, websites that have similar content that you have. More likely than not, they have guest contributors. And you can reach out to those guest authors to see if they're interested in blogging on your site. Likely, a lot of those people are freelance writers. So you can go about and hire them. So, for example, I would go on, you know, problogger.net, which is like, you know, blog all about blogging. And I would look at all the people who's writing for Darren, you know, who have contributed guest posts on Darren's website. Then I'm going to reach out to those people, see if they have a website. If they have a website and says, oh, I'm a freelance writer, I'm going to email them and ask them about their rates. And, you know, if we can come to an arrangement, we'll do contract work where where they would submit some samples. My editor would go go through them, um, give them feedback. And over time, that's how we have built up our team. Right now, we have 46 people in our team. So... So, yeah, so that's just a very systematic process, but very, very important. You need to know who you're writing for and what kind of voice you want to write in. And you'll find, t- you know, once you know that and you have a very clear direction, anytime you read a blog uh, at a different site, you would know, hey, this is, you know, my style or this is not my style. And if it's your style, then you want to contact that person. Another option is um, content marketplaces. Like textbroker.com is one that I use and for finding writers that are super high quality, you're going to pay based on a word count and how well that person's rated for their writing expertise. So if you have like a five-star writer, you might be paying 10 to 20 cents per word, but you know you're getting the quality. And at the same time, you have the middle company like Text Broker, which is guaranteeing that it's not being plagiarized and that the uh, relationship is going to work both ways with the content. 
So if you go to ZachJohnson.com, any content you find on that website is actually written by me. But if I was working with another client that needed some type of article, I already have established relationships through sites like uh, textbroker.com where I can say, okay, I need an article on this topic, this many words, it'll give me that price amount. And then somebody that actually has the expertise and can write really well can get that work done for me. Yeah, I'm going to add a tiny bit um, to this. We're talking about like larger amounts of content. We put out a lot of content and I would add just to kind of mine and probably Syed's, maybe Zach's, is I also have an editor on my team and that's a person that I trust with everything. And if they're, they say it's not good content, like start having a person on your team. You can hire freelance editors that will just, you know, edit for a certain amount of time every single day and do this. This is a very different skill than a writer. Um, and uh, on our team, for example, like we put out massive amounts of content. So we have several editors. We have a voice editor and a fact checking editor. These are three very, very different people with very different skills. And I rely a lot on them in the future. Now, again, this is mass scale. This is when you're doing a lot of content, not when you're starting out and getting this is more when you're getting to actual seven figure blogging where you're putting out a lot of content, you're going to need to rely on a team that manages this content, not just yourself. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Uh, I guess I think Zach touched upon this a while back about niching, uh, about finding a niche or how to find the perfect niche. You want to go, perhaps uh, Zach can go over that uh, once again, how do you about, go about finding a proper niche to blog about? Yeah, so... Everybody wants to start a blog for whatever reason, but if you want to make money with it, you need to actually niche this down so it makes sense. So a perfect example of this is sports blogging. Someone's like, oh, I'm going to write a sports blog about my favorite team. Well, honestly, you're not going to make any money with that. People go to ESPN.com because they want to get scores, highlights, and news. Nobody's going there to buy tickets or buy anything, actually. The only reason they make money is because they have so much traffic flowing through the website. So instead, you have to look at this from a business perspective. How can you get into the sports niche and actually make money with a website or a blog? So you can go from sports to basketball, then you can do basketball skills training, and then niche it down even one level deeper and do jump training. So how many people are going to Google every day to learn how to jump higher? What can it do to increase the vertical leap? Is there shoes out there that you can buy? Is there courses? And the answer is yes. There's the top selling products on sites like ClickBank, you can start promoting and the guy made a course about how to jump higher and increase your vertical leap by five to seven inches within a few weeks time. And he's making over $70,000 a month just from this course that he created. And as an affiliate, you could be earning 50% on every lead that you sent to this company. So now you actually have an audience that's going to Google every day because every day some kid is starting to play basketball and maybe he wants to make the basketball team. And if they're searching for this, they're going to invest time and money into it. So you can then provide the best resource possible, maybe make a few training videos yourself or a free PDF and say, if you want to experience this whole course, then I recommend you check this one out and you simply redirect them to that website. So that is how you can niche down from just having a concept in your mind of how to create a blog about something to actually making one that's profitable, creating a service where you're leading people to the end result and having a call to action that makes money. All right. So, so far we talk about creating blogs and uh, hiring writers and that kind of stuff. But I know that I do know that writing the blog post is only half the battle. And the other half is actually promoting it, getting people to know it. Like uh, you can have the best blog post in the world, but if nobody knows about it, then really what what is the point? Right? And so I want to ask, uh, ask the panel, what are the, some of the best methods you guys use to promote your blog posts? Uh, so one, uh, there will be lots of up here, but one of the best ways that I have used to promote our blog post is through syndication partnerships. Uh, we syndicate a lot of our content. So syndication basically means basically a copy of our content appears on another person's site with the proper tags that come back to and note that our site is the original author of this content. We work very, very hard on these types of relationships. Um, you know, we do social and we do other things. And I mean, they're experts at that, but we find that syndication is one of the best ways to actually get our content out there because our content is now syndicated daily to NASDAQ, to AOL, to Entrepreneur Magazine, to Mashable, to all these major 
sites out there. So when we write on our site, if we write an amazing site, it gets picked up and syndicated over to these other sites. And that's additional leveraging their audience to our, uh, to basically back to our site that has links, that has value. And uh, it that really, really helps promote our content. Uh, how does how does one get those kind of syndication deals? Sleep around. <laughs> there you go. That's kind of. Uh, no, I mean, it, it's just meeting the right people. Um, so, you know, for example, um, you know, when we first started, you know, I reached out to certain people. Like I syndicated with Zach. Mm -hmm. I syndicated our content. If it was blogging content, I syndicated to Zach's site. And that started us off. There's one syndication partnership. I believe we did it like twice a week. Right. And then I used that and just worked my way up. It didn't start just one day with us syndicating to Mashable. It started with smaller sites, and then we worked our way up. We still work with a lot of those sites, including Zach and a few others that we syndicate our content to. I just found the right person. Zach owns the blog. Hey, Zach, can I do this? It's really good content. He knows it's good content. He worked her. He you know, allowed us to post on there. And then we worked our way to other sites out there. And then once we got into this, we started, you know, noticing the other sites syndicated places. So I found the person who was over syndication at those sites and I became friends with them, took them out for a few drinks, spent some money, got them drunk. And they were like, oh yeah, I know this person. They, we became friends. I'm not saying that's the way to get every friendship, but because <laughs> I don't even drink, which is really hilarious that I got other people drunk. But um, I, you know, I became friends with the people who do this as their job and they introduced me to other people. And then once people start realizing that you have really amazing content, they'll start contacting you. And now it's almost all inbound. Mashable was inbound. They approached us for a syndication relationship. Yeah. And, and don't get confused that, uh, example with him sleeping around that wasn't over here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was not. Um, I, you guys probably have some but, uh, other amazing. Uh, yeah. One thing that content. I like to do is actually turn my best content into infographics. And this is something that can easily be done if you know the right people or find designers. So a great article goes live, you send it off to a designer and say, create an awesome infographic about this. You can then add it to that original post and then hire someone to actually submit that infographic with a backlink to the original post and they'll submit it to a whole bunch of infographic directories. And this can cost you easily under $50 and completely be outsourced. So that's one quick tip that uh, I would recommend. Uh, yeah, repurposing content is, is definitely one way to go about it. Uh, we did it on our List25 blog. It's one of the websites that, uh, that, I, that I own. Uh, we have over 2 point some million YouTube subscribers and 500 million video views. And the way we launched that YouTube channel was taking our blog posts and turning them into videos in 2012. So January 2012, I just took all of our content and just started reading. You know, it was an image slideshow where we just read the content on YouTube. And nobody was doing that on YouTube. So that channel completely blew up. And right now we're in the top 1,000 YouTube channels. You know, literally half a billion views. It's a lot of views. Um, so repurposing content, um, like what Zach did, because video was very easy for anybody to embed. Because, you know, WordPress makes it very easy. You just type the link and it embeds on the thing. So people were more than happy to embed our video because uh, user doesn't really leave their website. They can consume all that content there. But what that was doing was growing our brand recognition because every video had a List25 logo. And then people would say, I want to know more about List25. Then they would go to our website and they would go subscribe to our channel. And here we are, you know, from 2012 to 2017, 2.2 .2 million subscribers. Uh, and so that's, that's definitely one way you can do that with video. You can do that with SlideShare. You can convert your content into slides, like take some bullet points, condense them into slides. You can do that with infographics, as Zach talked about. You can also turn your some of the, your really popular blog posts into ebooks and and start giving those away. Maybe you know you can you can give those away on a site you're guest posting on. So I can go to like you know John's website and say, hey, I made this special ebook for all of his users, but really I just took my blog post and turned it into a PDF and gave it to his users. Um, I didn't do that, but that's an example. But in the early days, uh, when when I started in terms of promotion and getting traffic to our content. I basically made a cohort group um, and we would literally Skype each other and whenever a new blog post came out because we didn't have fancy things like Slack uh, and we would share our article there and everybody would share it with their audiences um, on Twitter, on FriendFeed, on Plurk and all, all, all those sites. 
So you can you should definitely do that. Uh, be, you know, join different Facebook groups and share your content there. Um, I know there's several out there that will that you have. You know, on Mondays you can share your piece of content there. Um, go to different forums, share your contents there. If you especially if you're in a tutorial style website like Quora or something like that. So or would, are, I would say if you're doing that, make sure that you're helping others out. Absolutely. The yeah. more you help others, the more it will come back to you as you're doing that. Absolutely. So we, so yeah. We have a question from that. Person? Yeah, so what are your thoughts on opt-in pages and how to incorporate that into your blog? Adding an opt-in page to your opt blog? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I have it on my blog. I mean, my, my goal when people come to my blog is uh, I want them to subscribe to uh, my email list or like me and friend me on Facebook. Or I want them to subscribe one in one way or another way. My, do, you the offer case, free, do you offer free things? Yeah, I offer beginning? free ebook. That's my, my ideal situation is that they opt in to get my ebook. Uh, failing that, you know, friend, follow me on Facebook, friend me on Twitter, that kind of stuff. But the worst case scenario is that they come, they read my content, they leave. Right. Yeah, because if, yeah, if you can capture them, uh, do it. And uh, I, I use Optin Monster to, to capture people who come to my blog. That's a product created by Syed. Highly recommend it. It works fantastic. And so, do you guys want to finish Yeah. There? So, yeah, it's actually pretty common, you know, Getting people to your website is easy. Keeping them there is hard. If you look on your Google Analytics, which I hope every single one of you have installed on your site, you'll see that probably 60 or 70% of your users are new. And, you know, about 30% are returning. So what, hap what, does, what does it tell you? That means 70% of people that are coming to your website are not coming back again. So you need to capture their email address so you can stay in touch with them. And that's why I, I built Optin Monster. You know, it helps me, you know, add these really effective forms uh, and give them ebooks, give them checklists. I find the checklists tend to work a lot better than like, you know, a 40 page ebook just because it's, uh, it's easier for users to consume. So, you know, give them something in exchange. These are called lead magnets, right? On Optin Bribe. So you just give them an exchange of an email address and so you can engage with them with your newsletter. And as your email list grows, that becomes a pretty big chunk of traffic for you because whenever you come out with a new blog post, you send it to your newsletter, all those users come, um, you know, read it. You have proper sharing call to actions and they're going to share it and, you know, more and more people will find out about it and share it. So. I, I will say um, kind of against having one of those on your site, you need to make sure what, what niche you're in um, and stuff like that. For example, uh, I have... Uh, you know, our, our site, we used to have that and it actually impacted, uh, we were getting, you know, people subscribing and stuff like that. When we took it off, our signups jumped by about 10% to our actual company physical product. So it was impacting our sales. Now we did a little correlation. We, we tested that to, and so we put it on for a month and then off for a month. And we noticed that jump. We noticed our revenue jumped as well with that. So we decided to take it off, but I still have it on other sites. Uh, as well. And then I have one side that's completely enterprise focused. Now, I don't really want, you know, if uh, uh, Microsoft, you know, a VP from Microsoft is coming to my side, I don't want a pop up that goes versus other sites. It's very, very valuable. So make sure it works for you. Again, this guy's the master at this. So he could tell you a million stories on how it's impacted things. I highly, I highly recommend it, but it's not for every single website out there. Thank you. So the question is, how many sites do each one of us have? Um, let's see. I have like five. I have more than a dozen. I have probably three or four. I have like 500 domains, but three sites that I really focus on. <laughs> we, have, we, have, we have lots of domains. Lots of domains. <laughs> Not all domain active, but yeah. Whenever I pick up something, I go, I just, if I, if I the domain, I just reserve it there. I just buy, I mean, you know. Seven dollars at wholesale, so it's cheap enough. Yeah, <laughs> but there's also a question back there. Oh, yes. So the question is: Several of us have print books, and how has that affected our revenue? Uh, yeah, I have. I have two books that I, I have published. In terms of revenue, it hasn't impacted that much. But what it does do is that it it really impacts your brand, because. Uh, one of my book is tight. The, the title is called Make Money Online. So basically, I tell people I literally wrote the book 
are making money online. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, and uh, yeah. <laughs> right, so no, and and I, I find that the, the book has allowed me to get a lot more press than I normally would because I am a published author. A lot of uh, media, like especially news media, you know, they really they all have an opinion, even though the news is supposed to be neutral, but you know, there's always left-leaning press and right-leaning press, that kind of stuff. So they really kind of express their opinion. So what they would do is they would ask an expert to express their opinion. They really want to express that they can. So when, when they do that, they always would, when they're choosing from the list of possible people to ask, the experts to ask, they will always tend to go to the published author. So they would say that John Shaw publishes or make, or make, author make money line. What do you have to say about, and I would give the quote. So, uh, in terms of actual revenue, the book doesn't make that much. I mean, I, I didn't really care if I actually made any money. It was it was a branding exercise more than anything else. Yeah, I do not have a book, and I have an eight figure business, so it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> yeah, I would say um, in comparison. I mean, I I have several different books. My my most recent book was actually from a blog post. It's a rewrite of a blog post. That did very very well so if you have an amazing blog post that does very very well most likely it will do well in a book form but to my bottom line i mean it this one should be a new york times bestseller and it hasn't really contributed a ton to my bottom line but it has contributed a, a lot to my credibility what's it called so people can buy 50 it? signs you're an entrepreneur okay yes. so pretty much anyone can write a book now you don't need a book deal you can just go to amazon upload yeah. a pdf file and then uh, the cool thing is you can get a bunch of them shipped to your house and then just walk into Barnes & Noble and put them on the shelf. And then, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> and then that's pretty much the coolest thing you can do with a book these days. There is someone on the panel that's done that. Put it into that. the four-hour we take a picture, you know. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, it makes no difference to your revenue. <laughs> no, it, it really doesn't. It, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's a good branding exercise, but, uh, you know, unless you're, you know, you're Tim Ferriss or Robert Kiyosaki, you're not going to be making much money from the book. And like uh, most people make, most people use the books just to get speaking. They make money indirectly, speaking engagement, that kind of stuff. So, so far our promotion we're talking about is mostly being about uh, stuff that we can do at very, very low cost. And, but we haven't talked much about, do, you, do any of you guys use like pay promotion to promote uh, your site? Yes. I want to talk about a bit about it. Like, let's have yeah. free traffic versus pay traffic. What should you do? So, I mean, you should do both. Uh, so we do a lot of paid traffic. Uh, the way we do it is we have a Facebook pixel that's, that runs on our, every single page on our website. So anybody who's coming to our website is getting a remarketing cookie. So I can then you know show them our other content. And then, um, so if you're on Facebook, you're browsing through, I will show you one of my popular posts. Let's say, you know, 20 ways to speed up your website. Obviously, if you, if you went to my website, WP Beginner, you have a website and you're looking to do something with a website. I think that piece will you know, definitely entice you. Or, or I might share you know, an ad with Ultimate, guide, uh, Ultimate WordPress SEO Guide that will help you get higher rankings in Google. So you're going to click on that or how to secure your website. So I'm running um, paid traffic to warm leads, people who are familiar with our brand, and bringing them to our uh, pillar articles, not just any blog post, but, um, but um, our, our pillar articles, it's because those articles lead to more people joining our email list. And when I have somebody in their email list, you know, we do autoresponder sequences where we promote our own products uh, and affiliate products. Like, you know, I don't own a security company, so I recommend like, you know, Securi, which is a company that I use, um, which is a VAF, you know, web application firewall. It helps you protect your website. So I'm recommending a bunch of services in my um, autoresponder, which helps me make more money. So whenever somebody subscribes to my email list, I know I'm going to make, you know, several hundred bucks at least um, from that user. So that's, what, that's when I'm, you know, spending money to acquire that customer. I'd say remarketing and retargeting is working extremely well right now. So the way that works is you can set up an ad campaign through Facebook or you can actually place a pixel on your website or you can import your existing email list. So only people that are already associated with you are gonna see those advertisements. So let's say I wanna run a webinar next week, I can do a paid ad campaign so all those people are gonna see it. And since they already know me, they're very likely to sign up for that webinar and it can uh, really get people to attend for anywhere between 50 cents to $2 per sign up. Versus if I go to just a general audience where it might cost me four to $7 to get those people onto my list. 
So anything like that with retargeting is working extremely well if you have a product or service to sell that you can actually monetize the traffic. Because what it's really doing is keeping the same visitor that came to you once is keeping them coming back and back and over again. So what you, what you do is you turn an average visitor into a fan and a, a fan into an ambassador. Um, so when, when you build that kind of loyalty, that, that user, that customer is going to stay with you for a long time. Like I have users who've been following me for eight years, right? And they buy pretty much anything that we put out just because of the level of trust they put in us because we've helped them, you know, throughout their career. Some of them, you know, started out as their own blog and have sold their blog for multi-million dollars, right? And, um, and now they're, you know, chief content officer at the bigger company that bought them. Uh, so, so, yeah, so it's really, really cool to see the ascension of the users that you've helped. Yeah, what I've done before uh, was I take my, my email list and uh, I upload it to Facebook and, create, and use that to create a custom audience. Mm -hmm. And basically, it, so if the, if the email list my email list matches the Facebook email, it will, it will produce an audience of, so I know those people are actually subscribe to my blog so I can just specifically target them. You know, uh, I could be, I could, I could, I could sometimes get real creepy, I put a picture of me and say, where have you been? <laughs> so, yeah. so, so we have a lot of questions, but only 10 minutes left. So, yeah, so open. maybe we should go to the audience. Now, if you have any, anyone any questions, just raise your hand and the mic will come around to you. Have the mic. Yeah, it's working. Um, you, you were talking about buying content from writers before, and I was wondering what you have to pay for good content when you're working directly with a writer rather than with a text broker or the service. It entirely depends on the experience of the writer. Um, so I'll tell you a cool story. I've, we recently found a guy um, from Envato Studio. So Envato is the company that owns Theme Forest, Code Canyon. It's a big marketplace. And they have a freelancing service called Envato Studio. And this guy um, lives in Sri Lanka. And he's new in the space, so he does not have a portfolio that's big enough. But his writing quality is really good. So I was really surprised that we, we paid him like $55. And he created a really, really solid piece of content. Which, like, you know, if we, if we were going to, work, to get done from an experienced writer, we'd be paying, you know, <clears throat> closer to 250 to 300 bucks. Um, so it depends on at what stage you're getting them, um, how experienced they are, but yeah. I, I would also say it really depends on the writer. I mean, my, my best writer, uh, for a thousand word post is 30 bucks. My second best writer is 260. That's how much I pay for the posts. They create the exact same content. My best writer, 30 bucks. My second best writer, 200 and some odd. Like, so I, I think it really depends on the writer. Um, I would say one thing that helps us pay a little bit less and will help you in the thing is paying people very fast and very consistent work. The more consistent work that I give writers and the quicker that I pay them. So my writers know that I invoice that or they invoice me on the 1st and 15th of every single month and they will never wait more than four hours to be paid. And that really helps drive down the cost because of consistency and quick money. Yeah, and one last thing to add, it's, it's all like when you start growing, it's cheaper to just bring them in house because you've already trained them to your style. Because if they're really good, they start gonna get, you know, popular, and then rates are gonna go up. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> all, right. all right, Jeremy, you have a question. So the so, question is, what is our social media strategy to bring people to our to our site? content? Oh, yeah. We are content. Use social media strategy. Yeah, I've been experimenting with. I used to, you know, just use Facebook to drive traffic to my blog, but lately I've been experimenting with just posting the entire post onto Facebook to see the difference in engagement. Uh, I, I started doing that with, with my video, my YouTube videos, and I find that uh, now now 
I posted a, a video on YouTube, but I also posted the same video on Facebook as well. I used to, whereas I would post a video on YouTube, then post a video on my blog, and then I would use Facebook to send the traffic to my blog. I'm finding I'm getting much better engagement by just posting the video directly onto YouTube. I mean, directly onto Facebook. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we have a significant number of following on all social channels. So our method is pretty much broadcast. So we're definitely, you know, doing a lot of link shares where, you know, we're bringing, just sharing the title, sharing interesting, you know, quotes from the article. Very important. Don't just share your blog post once and twice and then leave it to die because you spend a lot of time writing it. So we're sharing, you know, a post from yesterday, today, and then a few days. So we're sharing our article multiple times. We, you know, there's tools like CoSchedule that you can use to schedule the sharing of your post, like three hours, eight hours, the next day, seven days from now, 14 days from now, 30 days from now, 60 days from now, 90 days from now. So you have built up like a queue because, you know, if you, if you share something on Twitter, it, you know, only X number of people are going to see it. If you share it on Facebook, only X number of people are going to see it. But if you share it multiple times over a span of like, you know, a lot of different days, um, more people are going to see it. And because the type of content that we write is, is more evergreen than others, you know, this strategy tend to work really, really well for us. So uh, anybody else have a question? Yeah, I, I wanted to add quickly to that. Um, I have personally found social does not convert for my business. So it doesn't convert very, very well. We, you know, I have millions and millions of followers on Twitter, but it does not convert for my audience. Um, that, saying, that being said, that's not the case for everybody. And I do suggest trying things. We do promoted posts. We do things, but it just doesn't convert for us. So we don't really focus on it. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like if if you're using if you're using CoSchedule or missing letter, you can have different variations. So let's say if I have a blog post of 30 experts shares their biggest you know marketing mistake, I'm gonna have 30 different pieces of tweets or Facebook shares with like you know a snippet from John, a snippet from you, or a snippet from you know eight people. So those 30 tweets are not just a title and a link. They're different variations of you know from the content. So it tends to do really really well. We have less than five minutes. I know if you have a question. So the question is, what are the best ways to make money from blogging aside from ads and products? And also, which are the best uh, companies that pay the most, I guess? Let's go and you the most. Uh, there's well, a meat market happening there's upstairs. There's a meat market happening, <laughs> and I'm sure they all... The, the key to remember when we're at Affiliate Summit, you know, whatever they quote you, like as a revenue share or whatever, uh, you can generally negotiate that higher. Keep that in mind. They say, we'll give you 50%. If you can show them that you can do volume, that's not, it's totally, everything is negotiable. Right? Like uh, when HostGator says they'll give you $50 per customer you refer, uh, you can get a lot more than that. Well, it says it on their website. If if you get if you're yeah, doing like, you know you one sale, one one sale yeah. is fifty, and then I think if you're doing like twenty five or more, it's like hundred bucks. Yeah. So it's that, you know, but remember, you have to do volume before you can go and make demands like, oh, I want more. Not everything is negotiable. You have to yeah. bring value to the advertiser. Yeah. So I think affiliate marketing is 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 a big source of income. You know, yeah. I I highly encourage all of you guys to walk around the meat market. Um, you know, go to the exhibit hall tomorrow and, you know, talk to all the different vendors because you're going to meet people that, and, you know, there's also networks like ShareSale. They're going to have a great party tonight. They always yeah. do. ShareSale has tons and tons of uh, offers there that you can find and promote. Commission Junction is another one where you'd find offers, Impact Radius. So there's big networks where you can find ClickBank, et cetera. I think yeah. uh, you, you just look, you're basically, you're looking not for one product. I mean, you should have a series of product like there should be there should be three types or four types of product you first you get the free one for you to 
uh, get people to opt into your list. And then you'll have your, your trip, that's your tripwire. And then you'll have your lead manning, which is a low price product just to convert the lead into, to find out, separate the leads from the customer. And once you separate, the lead from, once you separate your leads from your customer, you want to hit the customer who, who's your customer with a much higher ticket item. All right. Oh, yeah, we're, we're time. So thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Hey, guys, make sure you. to circle right, 10. Please fill out the form. Make sure